uh, to celebrate Christmas, the, the first coming of Jesus Christ into the world. But there's this parallel thing going on as well where we talk about the return of Jesus, his second coming, and we, we prepare ourselves for that event as well uh, as preparing to celebrate the first Christmas, uh, which is when hope came into this world in a tangible way. Lord God, yeah, Lord God, indeed, and Holy Spirit, and Lord Jesus Christ, please speak through me today. This message comes with a great sense of trepidation on my part, and it comes with a good deal of spiritual warfare overnight. Lord, thank you for those who were praying for me, that your Holy Spirit prompted them to pray for me in the lead up to giving this message today. Speak to us and grow your church in preparedness, readiness, and strengthen our faith in Christ. In his precious name I pray. Amen. I was this close to calling it this morning. Uh, I had a heck of a night, but uh, I've run out of um, run out of those last minute get someone else to fill in for me cards. I did that twice last month. It was a heck of a month, and I don't want a month like that again. But um, look, the second coming of of Jesus is one of those things that does it freak you out? Do you want to live life to the full before he comes back? And you know, sometimes uh, we can. We can take that kind of approach as if, we're, as if we're going to miss out on something in this life that Jesus would come back and interrupt our fun. Oh, it's not like that. It's an incredible, incredible thing. The fulfillment of all prophecy. So much prophecy in the Old Testament spoke about Jesus, the Messiah, being sent by God to save his people. And when Jesus was born, the circumstances into which he was born, they were prophesied specifically centuries beforehand by Old Testament prophets. There's something in the order of 350, 360 Old Testament prophecies that are fulfilled by Jesus. It is unfakeable. You can't make that up. And it's fulfilled prophecy, which is actually one of the one of the reasons why many people who study scriptures from a, a sceptical perspective come to see that actually there's something bigger at work here and many have come to faith in Christ through the witness of fulfilled prophecy. But when it comes to Jesus' return, he tells us to watch because he'll return at an unexpected hour, we just heard. And earlier on in Matthew chapter 24 that Don read to us from, Jesus gives us other warnings. He, he does tell us to watch for the signs of the times. And yes, since Jesus preached those words, every generation for the last two millennia has been watching for the signs of the times. Paul, when he wrote the New Testament letters, was pretty sure that Jesus was going to return very soon, even in his day. Well, not even Jesus, when he talked about his return, was able to say when. That would be not even the angels in heaven, he tells us. No, only the Father knows. So he instructs us to be aware of the signs of the times going on around us. I want to thank one of our members who's here today. This preaching topic comes from a request to look at the Old Testament to look at the world around us right now, to watch for the signs of the times, and to consider the question, are we nearing the last days? The last thing I'm going to do here is try to become some sort of doomsday cult or whatever. That's, that's not the point. But readiness and, and preparation has entirely a different meaning 
for us as Christians. You see, at Advent, we wait for the return of the Messiah. Every day is Advent for us. He could come at any moment. And while we don't know the day or the hour, Jesus is very specific. We don't know the day or the hour of his return. He does tell us we can be aware of the season. Just as a fig tree starts to, to bud and grow, we know summer is near, he says to the, those in the ancient Near East. That's a, a piece of their agricultural cycle that he refers to there. Just as that is a sign, so too we can be aware of the situation in the world around us and it can help us to hone in on, well, the signs of the times. And I'm not going to unpack a whole heap of those today. Um, I'll hope to lead into that a bit more next week as we continue this message. But, yeah, we start to see greenery like this. We start to see, what a mess, who packed this up? It was me. <laughs> this, is, this is Karen and, and my former tr Christmas tree. We've, we've, we've dumped it. <laughs> Excuse me. Good grief. What I'm trying to say is um, uh, Karen's asthma is pretty bad. So we've gone to this Scandinavian style, apparently Scandinavian style Christmas tree, a pole with sticks on it, um, a very Spartan sort of thing. Thank you, darling. And uh, that's what, in fact, I, I put it up last week too. Karen could very easily put that one up because it's not dusty, unlike this. But anyway, it seems to be a job I've had for a decade, so I've probably got it for life. And uh, I put that tree up last week. I say apparently Scandinavian because a friend of ours in Finland I sent a picture to, and um, as she, she seemed really... It seemed weird to her. So they sold it as a Scandinavian tree to us here, but maybe the Scandinavians don't actually have trees like that for all I know. When we see the tree come out, we know that the season is approaching. It's a sign, isn't it, that Christmas is upon us. When we see the reef misshapen as it is, you couldn't roll that thing down the street. It's not a good circle, and that's my doing. But when we see the reef come out, we know that Christmas is approaching. <clears throat> and so there's certain things we can do to prepare and to be aware. I'm sure these are all part of the same bundle, and they are. By the way, I'm not going to settle... It'll be a long sermon if I was going to preach the whole time it takes me to set this up. It takes a fair while. Okay, but I'm just making a point here today. And um, there is an opportunity then um, during or oh, after morning tea to finish setting this up over there, probably. And I'm hoping we've got some good decorations here, do we? Somewhere? So, yeah, this is an open invite for all of you to help set this up. Um, Afterwards, what are some of the signs of the times that Jesus tells us? Are you familiar with some of them from Matthew 24? There weren't many of them in the Bible reading that Don read for us today, but um, there are some. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Wars and rumours of wars. Do we see wars in the world today at an increased rate? perhaps, to what they were beforehand? Yes, that could be a sign. Earthquakes, an increase in earthquakes, and yes, yeah, certainly there's been seismic activity increasing, and <clears throat> geologically speaking, you could probably say there's been times in Earth's geological history where, where earthquakes, um, the seismic activity on the planet is, is elevated for a period of time and then it goes away again. But Jesus says there'll be an increase in all of that closer to the end. What else? Sorry? Ah, the horsemen of the apocalypse. Jesus did actually, and Jesus and his angels did give that vision to 
his disciple John in the book of Revelation. Um, so the four horsemen of the apocalypse, um, there's different ways of interpreting those, ranging from a literal interpretation through to that it's allegory for um, things going on in the world in terms of governments, world powers, leaders and corrupt authority. Um, there's no reason why it couldn't be interpreted in both ways, both literal and allegorical, because prophecy has layers. It's like an onion. It's not just one way of understanding it. It has many, many layers to it. Ah, I heard the word Israel. I heard the word temple. And if you Google that stuff now, again, a variety of interpretations here. Um, it is quite controversial in some Christian circles. It depends on whether you take a literal approach to this or an allegorical approach. The literal approach often says these events are yet to unfold in a literal way. The allegorical approach says these things already happened in history. Again, with what we know about scripture and how prophecy works, and certainly the paradoxes that faith has, could it be both and? Could it be both and? <clears throat> um, if you Google or if you, whatever you do your web searching on, if you look up the third temple, you'll see that the Jews in Jerusalem have an institution there at the moment called the Temple Institute. You'll find that they have crafted all the temple furnishings described in Leviticus that were crafted for the tabernacle of God by his people in exile on their journey toward the promised land. Those same furnishings crafted for Solomon's first temple, beautiful and full of splendor as it was. Indeed, those same furnishings crafted in the second temple that was being finished off during Jesus' day, the Temple of Herod. Well, the Temple Institute in Jerusalem has put together the temple furniture once more. Can you tell me what's stopping them from building a third temple in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount? And not just any building. It's not like they can bring a wrecking ball to what's there. What's already there? Indeed. Do you think the Islamic world will cede a square millimetre of the Temple Mount? And so those who take a literal approach to these things would then say, if ever there's some world politician or diplomat extraordinaire is able to broker some kind of peace so that the Muslims will cede to the Jews the possibility of building their third temple on its original location again, then we have to start to wonder if it's actually possible for some of these things to happen literally and directly rather than just allegorically. <clears throat> They're some of the signs of the times, and I want to differentiate them from um, a thing called, can I come to you in a moment? Cool, thank you, Zach. Differentiate them from um, the millennium or millennialism, because that's been a very controversial topic in the church over the years. That's the view that in Revelation 20, the thousand year reign of Christ on earth, <clears throat> as it's described in Revelation, is one where either is allegory describing the age of the church since Christ's ascension, that already with Christ the church reigns spiritually over the earth and has done ever since Christ ascended to heaven and will do <clears throat> until Christ returns. That's one view on the millennium. That's the view that um, tends to be the mainline view. There's a more literal view, which sometimes is controversial, which says that Christ will bodily, physically return to earth and set up a thousand-year reign while Satan is bound in a dungeon. 
and believers will reign with Christ from Jerusalem over the whole earth during that thousand years. And indeed, in both cases, today's first reading from Isaiah chapter 2 speaks of that time. Now, I don't want to get into myself into trouble in going, I'm just going to say that the millennium is a controversial topic and there's various ways of understanding it. But when we talk about the signs of the times and the seasons in the world around us, that's a different matter altogether. Jesus is very unambiguous when he tells us to, to watch, to prepare, look at what's going on in the world around us. And certainly um, <clears throat> some of this could have taken place already historically at the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. Some of it might still be yet to unfold. Maybe it's allegory, maybe it's literal, maybe it's both. Whatever the case, we need to be ready every day. Zach, you were going to make a comment before telling me. <coughs> yeah. Oh, that's a big one. Yeah, thank you, Zach. Uh, Jesus himself says, the love of many. Don't know if some translations say most. But the love of many will grow cold. <clears throat> I feel a bit of conviction on that one, Zach, personally. Um, if I can make a confession here, here today, I've, I've spent a lot of time this year um, on YouTube, and I, I used to feel so um, righteous in saying, no, I, I, I don't use my Facebook account, and I haven't used my Facebook account much at all since being in Canberra. I used to be on it all the time. It was a, a distraction. <laughs> well, something took its place, didn't it, without me realising. Now, my point there is that YouTube isn't evil or anything like that. I'm not going to make a silly statement like that. But my point is I was spending a lot of time inputting banal things into my life, so much input that wasn't building me up as a person. <laughs> he tripped over <laughs> stupid stuff like, you know, um, now, how's that going to be beneficial to me, you know, watching stupid videos like that, uh, as opposed to things that are going to build me up in my faith, right? Um, <clears throat> and I don't mean to sound judgmental in saying that. Uh, but social media is a, potentially a good gift from God that we can leverage, right, um, in, in being good stewards of what God's given us as we are his salt and light in the world. But what I did find, the dynamic that came with that, was this real interesting sense of um, just not caring with a genuine heart <clears throat> or a genuine soul for the people who are important to me and being laissez-faire toward that. And since being more aware of that and since inputting um, something that builds my faith when I'm online rather than just entertains me, at a surface level, I've noticed that my love for other people has become more tangible and real. That's just one little anecdote. I don't want to make this about me, but that's just a reflection, Zach, on the love of most will grow cold. What other ways are there in which the love of most might grow cold, do you suppose, when we look at the world around us? If if that indeed is one of the signs of the times, and it is because Jesus says it is. <clears throat> yeah. When we see the news, we see a lack of love in the world. And that word you use there, Zach, apostatize. That's another sign of the times, the great apostasy. You know what that word means? Apostasy? <clears throat> it's a rejection of the faith. You reject Christ. That's apostasy. 
one of the signs of the times is that there'll be a great apostasy and the number of believers will be whittled right down to only few. We've farewelled a few people from Good Shepherd and I caught myself thinking, are we seeing an apostasy? But I had to correct myself. These aren't people leaving for faith. They might be joining another local place of worship, but they're not leaving the faith. But the great apostasy is something to be aware of. The love of most, if many, if not most, will grow cold. And so as all these things start to add up, the more of these branches go onto this trunk, the more this starts to take the shape the Christmas tree, the more these signs start adding up in the world around us, may they make us more ready for the return of Jesus at a day and an hour we know not. We mightn't know the specifics, but he does tell us to watch for the signs of the times. And when we continue this theme next week, we'll unpack a couple of those specifically, and um, see where this journey takes us. And if um, last night is anything to go by, didn't have a good sleep, let's just say, um, then there's someone or something who doesn't want me to proclaim this message about Christ's return. So please pray that I'll be a faithful servant as we continue this exploration together because it is important it is important father god <clears throat> you created that tree of life in the garden of eden described in genesis at the front cover of the bible and at the back cover of the Bible in Revelation, you describe once more a tree of life. Its leaves are for the healing of the nations. When the curse is removed and you've returned and made all things new, we enjoy the benefits of life as you've intended it to be. So just as the Christmas tree a few centuries ago became a thing to reflect that truth that there was a tree of life in the Garden of Eden and once more there shall be in the new heavens and the new earth. And that Jesus fulfills all of that. Help us, Lord, to be connected with the author and the source of all life, Jesus Christ, every day of our lives as we prepare and await his return. May we have a strength of faith. May we have endurance granted as a gift by you because our strength for endurance is weak. But for you, what is impossible for us, all things are possible for you. Lord Jesus, grant to us that gift. Thank you, Lord. Amen.